Well, thanks very much, uh, Kate. And uh, so we have now about uh, 25 minutes for questions. Um, uh, I think we've got some microphones, is that right? Around the place, yeah. So look, I, I might just um, kick off while you're, while you're thinking about questions. And I, I guess uh, when I listened to all the presentations, uh, yeah, the, the question of institutional design, it's a, it's a deliberative thing. It's something that, that people need space to be able to do. And you're all from very, very busy businesses. And I just, I just wondered if I could get a reflection, maybe from, from, from Tom and uh, from, from all of you perhaps, about uh, what, what is the sort of first step, a leader sitting in the audience today who, who goes, well, wow, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, I'm trying to um, create some reflection in my organisation about our institutional model and, and how we might you know, do something differently with that. How do you break the cycle of busyness to, and take that first step. What are some of the sort of, you know, personal tricks you've learned around um, getting boards, getting management teams, and etc., to have these reflective moments? Oh, I guess I could. One of the experiences I have these I found in recent year or two really is that when I speak with CEOs in particular, or sometimes directors of boards who talk to me about that very issue, how do we find um, time to do this stuff. Um, I find that they don't get, there's so much complexity out there for organisations like yours and it, it, in the same way that people are trying to figure out in the good sector how do we do stuff, well how, what does, how do we make good decisions, I, I reckon the, in the service organisations are trying to also understand what does good What's a good idea here for us? How do we? What are you learning in other industries? What are you learning uh, out in other sectors? And sometimes I find that I'm simply asked to come along and talk to a leadership team for an hour about what I'm seeing happening in uh, in a particular area that could be relevant to them. So I, I think those strategic conversations are absolutely critical to get a flow of thinking that's different. <coughs> Uh, it's, it's like you just need the disruptive thought to come into your mind, a little bit of space to do that. And it's bloody hard when you're getting hammered uh, in a day job. These are, these are tough jobs running these organisations. Everyone wants to cast judgement on you. Yeah, and I think the critical issue from an industry perspective is if you feel that way, contact your people you know in the industry and see if you can reach common ground on some issues that are very important to your business and don't talk about industry structures right because if you start that debate it's kind of you dig a bigger and bigger trench and realize that the both of you will be stuck in there for good so concentrate on the issues that matter and keep it small and, and concentrated. Mm -hmm. I think first up you go to your funding entities be it in industry or, in our case, the, our government entities and tell them that you're going to do things differently and then once they stop squealing and you get them back up on their chairs, you then um, go back and, and bring all your, your staff and, and your board together and then suggest they might want to do something differently and when they stop squealing and you get them back on their chairs, you just go ahead and do it. I think it, it takes a bit to actually step into an existing system and change it around. Uh, but um, there's a lot of, you know, just a lot of critical thinking. You, you take a look at what's wrong and you say, well, why am I repeating what's wrong all the time? And just step in and do it. I think everyone vacillates a little bit too much around some of these things. And they're brave people, but, you know, you think, just step into it. Kate, you got something to add on? Um, actually, just a couple of things, because this is one of those impossible questions. Uh, one is I actually think finding other champions who you can talk to about the, that big picture stuff is really important because otherwise you doubt yourself. And, and that is the joy of being able to find out and reach out to those people and have them help you do that job um, and keep you on track. I think that's really, really important. So I recommend that. And, and here are some, you know, mm -hmm. who I've had great conversations with. So that's important too. But the other one is to find the circuit breakers that you can actually use to scare the pants off people. And that actually helps quite well too, I think. Um, and that might be a, a loss of, uh, of market revenue, for example, in Tom's point, or in my point, it's when we brought in people to look at complex systems um, 
with our guys to have them fully understand just the danger of tipping points and feedback loops and, and what might happen to the system, but also what did they have control over and what did they not. And that was a radical reassessment because sometimes you realise just how big the wave is that's coming while you're busy looking at the seashells. And I think sometimes just really hitting people over the head with that is, is, is important to create that disruption into the, in the system. Thanks. Now, questions from the audience. There's one up the back there. Hello, um, Hayley Perbrick from Tabilk Winery. I'm also putting on a hat of uh, farmer's wife. So I'm part of the rice industry, the meat and livestock industry, the wine industry, the cotton industry. Um, so a lot of different industry bodies. And to me, innovation is very much, uh, a cornerstone of innovation is diversity. When I look upwards at my industry bodies, I don't necessarily feel like there's good age diversity, gender diversity, ethnicity diversity. Well, how does the panel feel about the role of diversity in innovation and transformation? And do you think that if we could broaden our horizons and include more diverse backgrounds in the conversation, we might be able to make these changes that haven't been, uh, which have been on the agenda for the last 20 years? Can I have a short bit? You know, nice question. Can, can I suggest the boys' club's a really comfortable place to be? And because no one rocks the boat, very great sundowners at the end of the day, but it doesn't actually change the agenda. Yes, you need to bring in other players, and those players need to be prepared to take, to walk into that situation. Because I can tell you, it's intimidating, it's tough, and people don't want to change. And no one wants to lose their authority or their position. So it's all about people management at the end of the day. So yes, diversity has a huge role if you're going to drive any form of change. So agree 100%. So I've got two points. So the research clearly shows that companies perform better when they have diverse boards, etc. So it's all pretty much logical, lay down was there. It doesn't happen. Um, and it doesn't happen because of the thing we often don't talk about, which is power, and the fact that people will protect their power um, and, and their comfort zone. So there, there are all sorts of other issues that stem from that, which is diversity is not enough. You also have institutional structures and situations that are embedded. And this is where there, there would be a fantastic conversation around transformation, because how do you actually get transformation in that system? Some great work showed that it was when you got about 30% of women in, in key roles in certain sectors that you would get the majority of pushback because it was almost like if you could have one or two women, that was fine, everyone was comfortable, they weren't challenged. 30%, not even 50%, 30%, so this is good research shows this, that's when people got uncomfortable and the pushback happened. And, and the pushback works. And that's because you actually have a system in place. So it's not just about changing the people, it actually has to be about changing the system and the structures that we actually have. And that's where I think some of what Brian was talking about actually becomes very important as well. There we go, I was, I was too nice when I gave my talk, but I'm making up for it now. <laughs> I think you need to create a movement. I find oh, that- me um, too, me I, too. <laughs> you really do. And I find, again, you're not developing, as they said, a, a model. You're actually trying to get a better outcome for an industry. and. Mm. Um, and that's all about the people. And I find mm. a lot of my time talking with um, industry associations and R&D corporations is when they're telling me what you can't do. And I find they want, they're very interested in stories I can share around how, how others have actually done this. And they start shaping an approach that would work for them. So we found with the seafood industry, it was women's networks, it was young people's networks, it was people who'd been through the FRDC's leadership program, and it was online. We were doing it through Facebook. We created a movement. We got to a tipping point, and people put in, you know, nearly three quarters of a million dollars out of their pockets within eight weeks. So, and the board is totally different to what we've seen in previous organisations. So you create there's a structure to how you do approach these things, and if it runs well, you get a more diversity. Go back to Kate. Yes, yeah, goodness, we could just now <laughs> take the whole conversation and spend the rest of our time talking about this. Um, the tipping point was quite, quite an important word for you to use there because um, tipping points don't necessarily occur. And look, I was told when I was, when I was young, 
that it was about demographics. So for example, in the university sector or other sectors, you would see that change automatically happen no. because it was just the time and the no. demographics. Now that's rubbish, that's crap. We can say that now. We can been, say crap. We've been through that. So that shows us that this is about more than just doing the right thing. There actually has to be something way more significant in the intervention because of the issue that, of course, if you, you, you will hold on to power and, and your comfort zone, even if you don't realise that's what you're doing. It's not necessarily a conscious thing. So it has to be more than just getting momentum. Momentum is not going to get us there. There has to be something much smarter which makes that change as well. So tipping point may or may not happen in a system, but a tipping point needs more than just the voice or the people. Tipping point needs something way more conscious to actually turn things around. Rod. Uh, Rod Keenan, University of Melbourne. We could probably add federal cabinet into that discussion. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I guess the, the skills that are required here to undertake this kind of research and to engage mm. with the industry and and, um, and to actually drive transformation are quite different than the traditional research Absolutely. skills um, that we might impart to in academic institutions to our, our um, people in research training. So um, what have you got to say about the kind of skills that are required to actually make these kind of relationships work? and how well academic institutions realise that they need to deliver those skills. Oh, I'll say something. I, I, um, when you're looking at the role of these organisations as orchestrating change, I, I believe that is a different style of leadership. Um, then, but if you look in the sector, there are lots of leadership programs being run within universities and elsewhere. And if you look and see where are they aimed at and who's attending those, they're not normally people from these organisations. They're actually they're targeting again the farmers and the value chain firms, which is great. That needs to happen, but I, I think there's a gap there in the market for how that. Mike, we entered into a multi-million-dollar program with a US university, and we looked everywhere in Australia before we did that, and. For my two cents were if the Australian universities have forgotten what they're really good at and that is preparing young people for their future and for a future career in industry. And I tell you, the US unis do it really well and, you know, industry will invest in that. And by coupling that, that path, that career development pathway with meaningful research in business, you, you're getting young people actually enthusiastic about an industry like, you know, because... The industry I come from, if you go to university, the message is stay there or else you will end up there. So you know, I think there's a real opportunity there for people that get focused on the kids. Yeah, I think part of the other issue is the uh, focus on reductionist reductionism and also on just pure publication as the end of the line. And that message gets given over and in our centre of excellence and all those, it's the same message. That's how you considered if you are successful in your role or not. Systems understanding applied science isn't valued. And whilst applied, and until it does get valued on the same basis, until impact and outcome gets valued, we're gonna be just going around the same treadmill over and over again. And it's a message that's out there, but it's still not being taken up. When I come across um, my academic friends and they tell me what their publication scores are and what their citation scores are, um, and they wait for me to be impressed, yeah, it takes a little bit because you've got to be looking for impact and, and we're still a ways off that. The ARC is set up poorly for that outcome. Many of our arrangements are set up poorly and that needs to change, otherwise you'll get this criticism back from industry. I just wanted to ask a question before we get another one from the audience. Um, starting perhaps with Kate, just, I just want to tackle the issue of, of, of working at multi-scale and in, in context-specific ways versus our ability to transfer learning across context. So, so 
we, we all found each other and, and we all love this stuff and we, and we all work on this stuff. <laughs> because we're really boring. And we're really, we're, we're kind of... And that's we, why we're we really surprised we were, so many people are in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we thought, thought we, we were just, we thought we were the little geek club and that, and we just, we're, we're really pleased to find lots of friends. But, yeah. but how, do we, how do we go about transferring this kind of understanding, the, the awareness of these issues? How do, how do we go about doing that? How do we transfer learning between contexts about this stuff? We're all doing similar things in different organisations. We're doing things like this within ABEs. You know, how, how do we how do we go about um, you know uh, like like uh, generalising what what we've started today here? Oh, nice question. <laughs> you go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Did you say for Kate, right? Yeah, yeah it was for you. Yeah, no, it's all, all falls That's on you, mate. So not fair. Did you see the buck just got past doing 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 and landed at me? Um, you mentioned multi-scale and context, that's why I'm picking on you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so really important because there is an issue, and I wouldn't have thought necessarily in this context it's not just about scale, but this is where, you know, the, the, the nerd in me would just love to be drawing up diagrams for us all to be mucking around with because there is this and this happening, of course. Um, and, and I think the transfer is as much about the sideways um, or the lateral as it is the, the up and down scale. So, but let's move away from that. You're actually wanting to get other people excited about this sort of stuff and you're asking me how we do that. Um, oh, and how do, how do we say support people who, who uh, you know, in their workplaces experiencing some of the things we're talking about and and you know, realise that this is a thing. This is a thing that you can actually learn to be better at, and you can, you know, you can actually find out from other Sheridan's people. Sheridan's going to go first. Well, okay. you know, one of the ways is just like with the Catholic Church during the Renaissance. <laughs> maybe she, she shouldn't. But maybe she should. Because <laughs> I am going to get struck down. Is you really do? Yeah, move away, move away. You you do have to take the the controlled thinking, the controls out of some of the process. Yeah. Because often you find yourself having to go back to government departments with the ticker box. And halfway through ticking the box, you are bored off your head and you say, I am not achieving anything here. And it grows that frustration that makes you just want to smash everything apart. The reality is you have to have some freedom of movement around institutional structures. You have to be able to bring your uh, some innovation to that agenda. And uh, look, it's, it's not happening enough. And I can understand why government departments want that structure, they want that ticker box, because it's much easier to manage and control. But until we get a bit more flexibility, until we have some grunt in our process, and I will say, as much as I'm not in it with the Americans, they do have a lot more flexibility in a lot of their system, and they do allow some better outcomes for that reason. We would benefit from having that similar flexibility in ours. So, just quickly, Hashtag thousands of local solutions was actually what we came up with as our way of summing up NRM regions when we were trying to get the message across easy, easily. And for me, thousands of local solutions is part of what innovation is, but it's part of the joy of working in my space because we do have that variability. Mm. And I loved your comment before about rules-based um, systems because really what we do is when it's not appropriate for one of our state-based guys to do it we say okay NGOs can you rock up we're needing someone who can work in this space that we can't so we share risk and we manage risk and we do that in a way because we're actually a bit of an ecosystem of all these very different organizations all working out you know for, for one uh, one lot of our mob it'll be working very closely with indigenous people for another lot will be working with the guys who dress in lycra and ride their kayaks around in Sydney to do the weeding called the Weed Warriors. I mean, the diversity is just remarkable. So we, in a sense, have organically created the opportunity for that to happen. But then we go, OK, well, how do we make that work better? So how do we connect this all up and get what we can out of it? And that's where we then create these collaborations, such as my part-time role for NRM Regions Australia, where we start then trying to find those ways to connect up those mad individuals who are totally obsessive about that particular thing. We connect them up and we share that, or we, we harness that in a different way. So it's also about having transient collaborative structures that are fit for purpose and appropriate that you, that you can create, but they all come from having a shared culture and commitment for the common purpose. 
We have a question down the front. Last one. Last one. God, that did sound like I was in church, didn't it? Um, Brian, this and Tom, this is probably targeted at you two, but although the, the women are providing the headlines, so <laughs> can, I won't stop you. Just introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Annabelle Cleland from Fairfax Media. I'm, I should shut up, but um, this is just a terrific topic. Um, <laughs> What, do you think the current RDC model is actually catering for um, producers like Haley, who are mixed enterprises? And is it preventing that cross-pollination of, um, of research and development into areas that cross over from livestock to pastures, um, you know, to different commodities? And, and with the current structure, how do you see that impacting progress and innovation um, for mixed enterprises? Do I get that sort of pause? I, I wonder how someone in a mixed farming enterprise navigates the, the kind of colossal structure that's been set up in this city uh, to represent them or you spend their R&D dollars. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it even happens in our business where we, we pay a transaction levy for, for cattle and a processing levy. We're making commercial decisions about every day about where to put our dollars, balancing the, um, the return from both areas. It's impossible for different organisations to do that. So whether we should be investing in some pasture research or some livestock research, how two organisations that probably don't talk to each other too much come to the conclusion of where to put the dollar, I don't know. So Typically yeah. better, Brian. <laughs> well, I think there's no... There's, whatever model you have, I, there's going to be a drawback to it, there's no question. Um, I find you always get the best guidance as to where things should go is look at what's actually happening in the market at the moment. Mm. And the best, the most immovable, um, or the best reference point is, is, uh, is the business people themselves. Um, so if you look in the market and you say, well, what's, as I said, what, are we seeing um, consolidation occurring across value chains? Are we seeing alliances commercially occurring? Are we seeing things happening at a regional level? Um, all of those things give you clues as to what, where's the commercial market going and how does the RDC model face the market? So that's, that is how I like to think about it. So whether you, you know, uh, th I, I think the RDCs have a, a challenging job, but they also have a lot of invest, a lot of money that they can invest, and they have a. Uh, uh, they, there is quite a bit of flexibility there if you want to take, do what you're saying, take a strong line on it. You know, we, we're running out of time. Just quick, you had a quick comment on that one, Kate. Yeah, there's there's two things. Um, one is we haven't talked much about public good, private good issues. And we haven't talked much about the immediate pressures for change or transformation and, and longer term ones. So in all of this, I just want to put in a, a pause for thought about the fact that we, we can, I, I can really see Tom's picture, but someone needs to stand up and say yes, but there's also um, another part of this complicated system, and that is um, the R&D and the work and investment that needs to go into the public good that maintains the private good, and also the fact that sometimes there's an immediate in your, in your face pressure that you're wanting to respond to, but there's also the over the horizon stuff. So we are also needing to make sure our system actually caters for looking at well, what's not hitting us in the face yet that we don't know about, but we need to be prepared for? So resilience is as much about being resilient to the here and now. It's about being resilient out into the future as well. So those are just two things that I think are important and that one might want to apply that lens also to the RDC model. Those are, those are massive topics, Kate, and we'll, we might have to park them for today. We didn't answer but, the question. So, um, and, uh, Annabelle, sure, we'll have to... Yeah, I just noticed we did well, but we didn't answer your question. Can, can we? Can no, we sorry, I was a, responding to those two as opposed. We've to run out of time. Let's let's have a conversation with Annabelle um, after the after the session. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of ABES, thank you so much for participating in our leading rural transformation session. Please join us for dinner. It's I think I believe it's on a lower level this year, um, where we'll have the the Science and Innovation Awards and the Australian Biosecurity Awards uh, presented tonight. But please join with me in in thanking our speakers.